I want to give you this message today. It is very dear to me when I came, uh, when the Lord blessed me with this. We are in spirit-filled warfare in, in this series. That's what we're speaking of today. We're going to be in spirit-filled warfare, the helmet of salvation. Now, this may be for you and may not be for you, but it, this is for us. So I want you to take this message for yourself and apply it to yourself. If you're listening on mygladtidings.org, this belongs to you also too. If you're listening, if you're streaming this message, this message glows to you and be encouraged today. And if you want to give to this ministry, we have a giving site on mygladtidings.org. And if you're listening, please give it. We covet your donations to the church for this ministry. I'm grateful today that we can get this message out to the masses, to the masses of people who may be listening today. Some of us may be going through spirit-filled warfare. We all are going through it. The helmet of salvation is our, on the docket today. The helmet of salvation. We're going to begin in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 through 18, and some of you should have this memorized by now. Because I've I'm, I'm been drilling this into our hearts and minds about the whole armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 through 18. I want you to be encouraged this morning. Hallelujah. Verse 13 starts out, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put up the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the firing darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, and with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Dear Jesus, we thank you this morning. You're kind, merciful, and wonderful, and I thank you for the service thus far. I pray that you encourage people all over this world, Lord Jesus, as we proclaim your gospel. And Father, that even though we're going through spiritual battles with the enemy, Lord, you're with us because you gave us the full armor of God. Lord, I don't preach in my own strength, but I preach in your strength, Father. I thank you, Lord, for, uh, for your message today and bless these lips of clay. And we give you praise and encourage every listener, every heart, mind, and soul in your sweet name. Amen. Once again, we turn our attention to the pieces that make up the whole armor of God. And verses 10 through 13 teaches us that the saints of God are engaged in a great spiritual conflict against a powerful, relentless enemy. Our enemy is identified in verse 11 as the devil, and the devil comes against the people of God with various wiles. He does everything in his power to destroy our faith and to draw attention away from, draw our attention away from the Lord of glory. It's God's will that we stand against the attacks of the devil. It's God's will. Verses 11, 13, 14 says that. And when we stand, we, we hold a critical position against the attack of the enemy. This speaks of a, of a soldier who refuses to yield even an inch of ground to an attacking enemy or foe. It is the image of a soldier on the defensive. Protecting the ground that has already been taken from the enemy. And it is what God meant, what he said, neither give place to the devil. That's Ephesians. God has given his people some very precious ground. We have the truth of who he is and how he loves us. We have his spirit. We have his word, his, 
the word of truth. We, we have this church. We have his blessings. We have his salvation. We have his grace. We have his compassion toward us. And we have much more besides all of this. Our enemy, the devil, does not want us to have anything that we have been given by God. So here's what he does. He, he does everything in his power to take away those blessings from us. Of course, there are some things the devil can't take away. So I like to, I, I, as I told you last time, he does everything in his power to take out and eliminate the influence of those things in our lives. He will squash and abolish the blessings of God that he cannot steal. If we're going to stand and hold the precious ground we have been given, then we must put on the whole armor of God. We have already examined the belt of truth, the, the, the breastplate of righteousness, the footwear of peace, and the shield of faith. Now, please forgive me for a little repetition as I briefly mentioned those pieces of armor we represent, they represent. We, we talked about the belt of truth. Speaks of a life that is built upon the faithfulness to the word. The word of God and to the God of the word. It speaks of our being truth, being, our, our being truth in both our testimony and our living. This belt of truth gives the believer stability so that they are enabled to stand. This belt of truth also provides a place for the other pieces of armor to rest. And then we talked about the breastplate of righteousness. It speaks of the holy life. It speaks of the life that is lived in conformity to the word of God. A holy life is a powerful defense against the attacks of the enemy. And when we allow sin to dwell in our lives, we give Satan a beachhead, as I said about this, from which he can attack us and exploit us. Sin gives Satan the ammunition he needs to assail the glory of God and to destroy and devastate our testimonies and reputations. Personal holiness closes the door to Satan and protects us from him when he attacks us. And then I talked about the footwear of peace. It speaks about our foundation in Jesus. When our feet are shone with the preparation of peace, the, the gospel of peace, it means that we are saved by grace and we know it. Nothing can change our minds. Satan may try and cause us to doubt, but when we wear the footwear of peace, we are sure-footed and secure in our salvation, and we cannot be moved. Therefore, we become a hard target for the enemy and his attacks. And then I talked about last week the shield of faith speaks about our daily faith in God that causes us to trust him in all seasons of life. When times are good, the just shall live by faith. When times are bad, the just shall live by faith. Even when the fiery darts of the devil are raining down all around us, the shield of faith protects us and allows us to stay in the fight for the glory of God. The shield of faith allows us to stand and having done all to stand. And when we live behind the shield of faith, we become an impossible target for the devil to hit. Praise God. So the piece of armor that has our attention today is the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. And the Bible says to take the helmet of of salvation. And in the days when men wore armor into battle, they referred to their helmet as a bonnet. Let's examine this piece of armor and consider what importance it has in our daily lives. Let me read verse 17 of Ephesians chapter 6. And it says, take the helmet of salvation 
and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the helmet of salvation. Now, let me tell you about this helmet. The helmet worn by the ancient soldier was in utmost importance. The helmet was either made of thick leather covered by plates of metal, or it was made of solid metal that was beaten into shape of the human head. Most ancient helmets had, had, had metal extensions that covered the cheeks also. These extensions were designed to protect the face. Now, the purpose of the helmet is obvious. It was to design to protect the head. In ancient times, many armies employed cavalry. These soldiers were mounted on horseback and most carried a, what, a sword called a broadsword. It was different from the short sword mentioned in verse 17. See, the broad sword was a sword, it was a two-handed sword that was usually between three and four feet in length and have a double-edged blade. It was a big, heavy sword. You couldn't just do it with one, one arm. Now, I know there's some that were strong that probably could, but most, you had to hold this sword with two hands because it was double-edged and it was thick. The sword was swung by mounted soldiers in an effort to either split the skulls of the enemy or to decapitate them, to take their heads off. The helmet helped us to deflect the blow of the broadsword and therefore protected the foot soldier from injury. Our text today says that the spiritual helmet we are to wear in our spiritual battle is the helmet of salvation. This shows and applies that Satan's blows are aimed at our minds. Let me say that again. This shows and implies that Satan's blows are aimed at our minds. He is determined on destroying our sense of security and our assurance in Jesus Christ. If the devil can strike a blow against us that causes us to become discouraged and filled with doubt, he will have little trouble putting us aside and taking us out of the battle. See, like the ancient broad sword, the word handled, the word, the sword handled and used by our enemy, the devil, is a two-edged sword. One of these edges is discouragement which I'll talk about, and the other is doubt. Let's look at the helmet of salvation and learn how these pieces of armor can protect us from discouragement and doubt. This helmet protects us against discouragement. Let me talk about that first. You know what? If we are properly protected, the devil will use the sword of discouragement to defeat us in our walk with the Lord. He will cause us to look at our sins. He'll look at, look at our failures and the problems in our lives and the health issues in any other negative situation we face in our life with discouragement. When he gets our attention off the Lord and on negative issues we face in life, he knows we will begin to doubt the Heavenly Father's love and his care for us. This has the effect of causing us to be discouraged, folks. And even though, even those who have been in the battle a long time, if you, even if you've been in the battle for a long time and have enjoyed much spiritual success, you can find yourself the victim of discouragement and disillusionment. You know, consider, for instance, here, and think about some people here, Prophet Elisha, Elisha. Not many people have ever enjoyed such a string of great spiritual victories like those enjoyed by Elijah. Praying fire down from heaven. Slaying the 450 prophets of Baal. Reign after three and a half years. Outrunning the chariot of King Nahab all the way from Mount Carmel to Samaria. What a day. Then the next day there came a word from Queen Jezebel. She was so angry at Elijah, and she said, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if you do not make your life, do not make your life as a life of one of them by this time tomorrow. That's in 1 Kings 19 and 2. 
So, so Elisha hears this and runs for his life. He travels to Beersheba and throws himself under a shrub and prays to die. Because of some little scrawny little woman who gives a threat. First Kings 19 and 4 says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. He was so discouraged that he was ready to quit on God. We got some people who are ready to quit on God. He was ready to resign from his office as a prophet and go out into eternity. God showed up in that wilderness and rebuked the prophet, and here's what God asked him. He said in 1 Kings 19 and 9, he says, And there he went into the cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah's reply indicated that state in his heart, the state of his heart, 1 Kings 19 and 10, it says. So he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your word, your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I am alone left here. And they seek to take my life. Poor Elijah. But here, here, but God assures Elijah in a still small voice, he says in 1 Kings 19 and 18, he says, Yet I have reserved 7,000 Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mount that has not kissed him. See here, Elijah learned that the truth, that the spiritual victory does not insulate us against discouragement. Someone has said this, and I remember this from a great preacher. He says, Satan has many tools, but that, dis- but, but that discouragement is the handle that fits them all. There's much truth to that. You may have been saved for years, but if the devil can get you discouraged in your walk with the Lord, he can get you out of the battle. If he can get you focused on your problems, on your failures in life and your shortcomings of others, or on the negative thing at all, he can overwhelm your defenses, I want you to know this, and cause you to doubt the Lord's goodness. You know what, we, we, we don't think about it this way, but, 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 but it's true. Thank you, Jesus. When we allow problems, pain, and people in other situations to make us uh, discouraged to the point where we quit on God, the devil has won the battle. For a period of time, he has caused us to doubt the goodness of the grace of God. And regardless of the reason we name, when we allow Satan to discourage to the point where we stop serving the Lord, we are at that moment looking at God in the face, thank you, Jesus, and telling him, I don't believe you are bigger than this. Thank you, Jesus. That may sound far-fetched, but it's true nonetheless. And then, then the book of Job reveals a precious saint of God whose helmet was in place. I thought about Job. Satan unleashed his fury of hell against Job. And still Job refused to doubt the goodness of the Lord. Job didn't understand why his children had to die. Why his health health had to be taken away. And why everything that he had worked his whole life to accumulate was lost. Sometimes we ask why. But in the midst of the pain and problems, Job continued to trust the Lord. In Job 13 and 15, it says, though he may slay me, yet I will trust in him. Even so, I will defend mine own ways before him. See, Job's helmet, I love this, thank you, Lord, deflected every blow of the enemy and protected his fragile spirit from injury. Another man who who wore the helmet of salvation uh, to great benefit was the prophet Jeremiah. When the Lord called Jeremiah, the Lord told him that he would be rejected, persecuted, and attacked. 
and Joe and Jeremiah was persecuted and attacked every day of his life. But yet Jeremiah said this in Jeremiah 15 and 16. He says, your words were found and I ate them. And your word was with me in the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. So be sure, be sure that the helmet of salvation is in place. And refuse to allow Satan to focus on your attention on the events of life or by the actions of people. If he can get your eyes off the Lord and on the difficulties of life, you will be easy prey for the slashing broadsword of the enemy. You know what? It, it, it's not hard to be discouraged. Especially when everything seems to be going against you. It's easy to be discouraged when the answers of your prayers are delayed. It's easy to be discouraged when your preaching and teaching and witnessing seem to be ineffective. Discouragement, let me tell you this, is our default setting most of the time. Satan knows this and he exploits this weakness in our lives. Even when we are discouraged by the ends of life, we must never forget. Say, remember this. We must never forget that our Father always has our situation well in hand. Let me tell you something. He can be trusted to what is right all the time. Say it with me, all the time. Romans 8 and 29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Therefore, we must not be weary in well-doing, but we must carry on knowing that in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So when we face the enemy in battle and Satan aims the broad sword of discouragement of our hearts, discouragement at our heads, be as 1 Peter 5 and 9, 5, 8 and 9 says this. He says, he tells us that it is to be sober, be sober, be sober, be vigilant, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion. Seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. And what about the helmet and how it protects against doubt? I want you to get this here. The other edge of Satan's broad sword is doubt. And when we come to doubt our salvation or when we come to doubt the word of God, we, really is easily, we are really easily defeated by the enemy. When we doubt our salvation, this is important here. When we doubt our salvation, we'll be discouraged. And when we come to doubt God's faithfulness, we are easily discouraged. When we come to doubt the word of God, we have the very foundation for our hope in the Lord. Our very foundation and hope of the Lord is weakened and damaged. I just felt that from someone. And we have no ground upon which we can stand on. You know what? If Satan can convince you that you're not really saved... Or that somehow you have lost your salvation. You will be devastated spiritually. Such doubt paralyzes the believer and makes them unproductive and miserable. Nothing more quickly sidelines the child of God than having their peace and security in Jesus stripped away. When we forget this truth of Jesus who said, oh, thank you Jesus. He said, peace I leave with you. 
My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. He says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And that's in John chapter 14, verse 27. If, if, we, if we forget that verse, that verse of truth, we are easy prey for the enemy. Satan has an easy time defeating a believer who has lost the assurance of salvation in Jesus Christ. In this house, who sure, who knows that you're saved? Who knows it today? And you're assured of it. If Satan has been beating you with the sword, let me remind you that if you're in Jesus, you are secure in Jesus. Here's some word of God that will encourage you. Get ready. John 6, 37 through 40 says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but shall raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life and will raise him up the last day. I'm part of that. How about you? John 10, 28 through 29 says, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has, give, has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I'm part of that. How about you? Romans 8, 38 and 39 says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor debt, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Who's part of that today? Philippians 1 and 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I'm part of that. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away. Reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. I'm part of that. How about you? See, see, when Paul takes the helmet of salvation, when he talks about this, he's not referring to being, to, uh, to being saved. He is, after all, speaking to people who are already saved. What he means here is that we are to stand in the full assurance of salvation that we possess in the Lord. You know, we are to hold on to that truth. The truth that if we're saved, the Lord has redeemed us and he has promised everlasting life to us. You know what? That knowledge, let me tell you something. That knowledge will allow us to deflect or to, to ward off the broad sword of doubt. When the devil tries to attack us in the area of our salvation. See, when Satan comes against you, and he will, stand your ground in the Lord knowing that you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You know what? Because he brought you, he bought you with his precious blood. He lets us know that we are his. And he will not abandon us. And he will give us grace sufficient for the attacks that come against us. And he will keep us through the battles of life and he will deliver you safely home to glory when this life is over. Amen. Second Timothy 1 and 12 says, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed for I know whom I believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. 
Hallelujah. And here's the key. Here's the key. Be sure you are saved. Be sure you're saved. If you're watching, be sure that you're saved. And this is for all who are watching and listening to this sermon today, whether you're in the house or listening. Be sure you have more than just a church membership or some vague relation, religious experience. Be sure that you're trusting nothing but Jesus for salvation. Be sure that you're resting in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be sure you are born again. Be sure you believe in the gospel of Jesus, the good news. 2 Corinthians 13 and 5 says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. 2 Peter 1 and 10 says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. And if you're listening today, the implication here is simple. Don't take the helmet. Well, let me put this way. Let me just say it like this. I want you to understand. Don't take what you think you have for granted. Don't just assume that you are saved because you have checked off a box or two on the Pentecostal salvation checklist. Again, if you're listening, there are several things that we need to examine to be sure where we stand with the Lord. Look at your life and see how you're living. Look at your priorities. Look at what you love, what you do, and what you live for. Look at what you're trusting in for salvation. Look back and carefully examine your salvation experience. What happened in the moment that you're trusting as the moment when you were saved? Was there an awareness of your lost and the sinful condition before the Lord? In other words, was there conviction of sin? Were you compelled to come back to Jesus alone for salvation? Was there a moment when you looked away to him by faith and instantly saw the truth of the gospel? Was there a change in your life? 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Listen. I'm not trying to make anyone doubt their salvation today. I'm simply trying to get you to examine your salvation experience. And I want you to be sure you are saved. I do not want you to go to hell trusting a false profession. And that's what the enemy wants us to do. I want you to be able to stand when the enemy comes against you and seeks to make you doubt. I fear that sometimes we blame our doubts on the devil when all the time it is the Lord who is trying to show us that we need to be born again. Put on the helmet of salvation today. Again, put on the helmet of salvation. So as I end today, if you're streaming this today or by internet or if you're in this house and you're watching and listening, here's the question of the hour. Are you saved? Are you sure? 
Or are you secure in your salvation? And if all those pertain to you, if you're saved, lift those hands right now. Raise both hands. Raise your leg or foot if you can. I'm letting God know today I'm sure of my salvation. Are you sure today? Praise God. And put them down. How about discouragement? You know anything about that? I do. I, I, I know about discouragement in my life. And you know, it can be devastating. All of us have at one time. However, the Lord is able to keep us even when we are discouraged. If you are discouraged today, you need to bring that discouragement to the Lord and he will help you with that. What, 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 what about doubt? What about doubt today? What about doubt? Has, has the devil been hacking you with that broad sword of doubt today? Why don't you come before the Lord and get in front of the Lord today and ask him to help you to take the helmet of salvation? He can settle your spirit and give you peace today. One thing I know is he, is in, he, is, he can enable us to stand against everything the devil throws at us. You don't have to be defeated by the devil. We don't have to be defeated in enemy. He doesn't, he, he doesn't deserve victory. He deserves defeat. You can withstand the assaults of discouragement and doubt and bring those things to God and get some help. If you're saved and you know you are and sometimes discouragement will come. Instantly when you feel it coming, get in front of God and ask God to give you peace in the situation and circumstance. I pray with certain situations that's in our house today that there won't be any discouragement or doubt. I pray for peace and strength. And if it's coming upon you, any type of doubt or discouragement, get in front of Jesus. And if you're settled in him today, why not just praise him for his grace in your life? If you're settled and know that you are settled and you've got everything and, and you, you, you're, you're not doubtful or, or, or discouraged today, give God some grace and give him some praise. Listen to his voice and do what he's telling you to do. I thank God that I have the full armor of God to take me away from discouragement and doubt. Folks, I know who I belong to. How about you? We all should know who we belong to and whose we are. We belong to Jesus Christ, the victor of Calvary, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who is sitting on the right hand of God, who is the author and finisher of our faith. And I have no doubt, and I'm fully persuaded that nothing can separate me or separate us from his love. And I'm so grateful for that. And if you're watching today and listening, some of you don't have salvation in your life today. I'm going to go there. Some of you watching me and they need Jesus to come into your life and do an overhaul in your heart today. You mechanics and in the house and people know engines know what an overhaul is. You need your heart redone. He's able to come and clean you up and turn you around for his glory. And I want you to be totally honest with yourself. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Be, be totally honest with yourself. And make the right choice for salvation. You know, Jesus can make the difference. And also salvation is free. It's free. 
it, it, it's, it's time to, to, to take the helmet of salvation and have that right relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He can protect your mind. He's coming soon. I, I, I tell people, I tell you that today, if you're watching, if, you, if you're in the house, if you're streaming this, he, he, he's coming soon. I implore you, he's coming soon. Can you say that you are totally ready if you die today or if he comes back in the next hour? Can you say that you are ready if you look deep down in your heart and be honest with yourself? Examine your heart today. And ask the Lord to come into your heart, mind and soul, and be sure of your salvation. If you're not, why don't you meet him now? Because you don't want to meet him later. I'm going to give you a moment. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, God. Make up your mind to serve Jesus today. And I'm thankful that I can give this gospel message to you and invite you to Jesus. But invite Jesus in your heart today. Tomorrow's not promised, but invite him in your heart today. You may be thinking about taking your life today, if you're watching. You may be thinking about taking your life. I, I implore you let you know that you're precious in the sight of Jesus. Whether it's some pills or gun or something, knife or whatever, don't let the enemy deceive you in discouragement and tell you you're no good because he will. He'll give you doubt. He'll put in your mind, why, why, why am I living this life? Because this world is better off without me. But let our Jesus give you purpose in your life and he will. But you have to invite him in and let him do the work in your heart. And he will. He loves you. So if you want Jesus to come into your heart, I want you to say this prayer with me. And everyone in this house, I want you to repeat this and agree with those who may be watching or someone in this house. Say this with me and say this out of your heart. Be serious. Dear Jesus, I thank you for this time in my life that you have granted me. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you died on the cross and you rose on the third day. I thank you, Father, for letting me say yes to you, yes to your will, and yes to your way I give you my life I give you my heart I give you my soul come into my heart Lord I invite you in give my life purpose and meaning I want to be saved I want your salvation in my life I can't live without you I tried everything else, but nothing will work. But Jesus, I know with you in my life, I will have peace and security. And I thank you for letting me say yes to your will and your way. Not my will, Lord, but your will be done. 
Forgive me of my sins and my shame. Make me a new creation. And I believe that you will. Now, Lord, I believe. Say it again. I believe you have saved me. My life is yours. And I'm a new creation. And I will live for you forever and ever. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for saving me. And I know I'm saved. No doubt about it. I am saved. And I thank you in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Give God a hand praise today. Hallelujah. Praise.